the the next portion of uh, the meeting um, belongs to Steve Dar from Dynamic Aerospace, who's going to give us an ADSB weather update. Um, Steve, um, I, I did I did grab your deck. Thank you for sending it. And when I opened it, I had to I nearly had to get a pants change because I saw how many slides were in there. So either you're going to speak really really fast. Um, or we're going to eat dinner really, really late. Anyhow, I hand it over to you, sir. Well, I'm not going to sound like the chipmunk, I hope. <laughs> How's the audio? Uh, my intention is to only take uh, about 15 of the charts, and uh, the remainder are for um, and, and uh, for detail for those interested when they get distributed. Uh, or posted. Can you speak up a little louder? Yeah, or get a little bit closer, please. Sure. Um, so my intention is to brief only 15 or so of the charts. The others are there for uh, for completeness for those who are interested in more details. Woo! <clears throat> so when I go to the next chart, I um, I tried to find an uh, an antonym for disclaimer because I didn't want to put in a disclaimer uh, or call this a disclaimer, but um, there aren't any good antonyms for disclaimer. So I did want to say that, you know, I miss being there. I miss uh, catching up with uh, with the people that normally happens during the meeting. And I really do hope that all of you are, are well and uh, that your families are well and that you stay that way and, and look forward to catching up uh, at the fall meeting. If you go to the next chart, um, <clears throat> Matt mentioned that there have been some developments in the ADSB weather uh, work, and um, they came sort of fast and furious from the very beginning of December uh, through the end of February. Uh, right at the end of November, AOPA reported to Rocky Stone, our uh, SC206 chair, that um, the data they had suggested that general aviation had equipped with uh, the 1090 megahertz extended squitter ADSB devices um, more than four to one compared to UAT. So more than 80% of the devices in the in the GA aircraft were were 1090. Um, and 206 had been planning to pursue a downlink of ADS uh, of PIREP information on the UAT link. And it became clear as we approached the uh, mandate date that uh, capturing at most 20% of the equipage probably wasn't uh, going to be a successful strategy to increasing PIREPs in the way we wanted to be able to. And so uh, they asked whether or not it would be possible, possible to put uh, PIREP downlink on 1090 um, and um, and I took a look at that and um, uh, it appeared to be technically feasible. And so um, began an effort to coordinate with stakeholders to establish support, knowing that the Combined Surveillance Committee, which is responsible for the uh, ADSB MOPs uh, for 1090, uh, had already passed its deadline for introducing new capabilities and in fact was facing its last meeting at the end of January um, prior to putting the document out for uh, final review and comment. So um, between uh, the beginning of December and end of January, uh, uh, we worked to develop uh, PIREP requirements um, and present them to the uh, Combined Surveillance Committee in conjunction with the ADSB air report requirements uh, and appendix that had been developed. Um, and initially reluctant to the CSC before the uh, end of their meeting agreed to allow development of the ADSB PIREP uh, test procedures and an appendix to go along with the requirements that had been presented uh, as long as that took a second, um, second priority to completing the uh, ADSB air rep um, test procedures uh, which would accompany the uh, requirements and appendix that had been um, also presented. And so uh, working throughout February, the weather surveillance subgroup of the uh, combined surveillance committee uh, 
developed, uh, completed development of the ADSB air rep uh, mops elements and and also uh, ADSB PIREP uh, uh, requirements and test procedures, and an appendix that describes a concept of operations for um, for ADSB PIREPs, <clears throat> and submitted those for uh, inclusion in the 1090 ADSB MOPs. And um, on the 20th of March, that MOPs was approved for um, final review and comment. And so uh, that was a, a large undertaking in a very short time, and um, we think we'll be successful. Uh, we'll know as we get comments back from the stakeholder communities that are reviewing those MOPs, um, which, uh, which we'll have by the end of the first week of May. The next chart. Uh, I think everybody in this group knows that uh, using aircraft as weather observation platforms has a long history. It started with pilot reports uh, and continued into automated aircraft reports. Today, the MedCars program um, uh, produces a lot of data that's uh, critically ne needed by uh, weather forecasting, not just for aviation, but uh, outside of aviation. And in fact, since the um, since the reduction in air travel in response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic started, there have been a number of articles uh, talking about how weather forecasting has become less reliable as a result of airplanes not flying. So uh, in terms of uh, what is ADSB weather, it's, it is part of ADSB version three. Um, the air rep, or air report uh, enables uh, fully automated routine broadcast of, of the data sensed on board or derived on board uh, the aircraft. Um, and PIREPS adds to that by enabling submission of pilot observed weather uh, via the ADSB data link. Um, the ground receiver network for ADSB is, is operating. Uh, there are plans to update it <clears throat> to ensure that it is capable of receiving and distributing all of the different data elements associated with the ADSB version three messages. Uh, that said, uh, the mandate is currently uh, based on ADSB version two, and there are no plans to, uh, to mandate version three aircraft equipage, although um, the normal uh, sequence of events would go, uh, would see ADSB version three uh, being installed in newly produced aircraft within a few years, and um, and that would forward fit the uh, uh, the equipage. To go to the next chart. Uh, so, what does the future look like with ADSB? Well, um, we know from studies we've done on the impact of uh, air reps today, that uh, more air rep data uh, would provide for more accurate, more precise weather forecasts uh, that would provide for uh, more rapid and more accurate uh, weather awareness, and in particular, improved avoidance of hazardous weather. Uh, with the advent of uh, ADS weather PIREP, uh, we would also expect to see, based on uh, surveys done by AOPA and uh, FAA, um, to see more PIREPs submitted with fewer errors, and the fewer errors would be associated with the automation that would uh, gather the data. It would also make PIREP submission uh, independent of air traffic controllers and flight service stations because it would be fully automated uh, to include the encoding of PIREPs. And, and those PIREPs, once encoded, would be available for dissemination via existing networks. So the uh, rapidness with which uh, PIREP processing would take place would be, uh, would be sped up, and, um, and you would see the same kinds of uh, impacts uh, where PIREPs are, are submitted that you see where uh, they're submitted today and, and where, uh, where air reps uh, would be submitted. So uh, we heard a number of times today that PIREPs are critical to weather forecasting and to uh, uh, validation of 
and to of uh, air mets and, and sig mets and uh, all of that would remain true uh, given pyrex submitted via adsb so uh, in more detail the next chart talks about the kinds of applications that would be supported by adsb weather uh, within air traffic <clears throat> there would be uh, greater routine weather surveillance uh, better hazardous weather detection and avoidance uh, there's a direct support for interval management and the productivity that we think that'll bring, uh, both ground-based and, and uh, flight deck-based. Uh, it would increase traffic awareness on the flight deck. Um, and um, uh, on, the, on the wake turbulence side, being a long-term supporter of the efforts to put ADSB weather in place, um, hazardous wake avoidance and en route uh, airspace in particular, uh, would be enabled and uh, would be improved in terminal airspace. Uh, there are uh, the major air, airframe manufacturers are today looking at experimenting with wake surfing to do uh, uh, energy saving and um, both Airbus and Boeing and, and the US military and others have demonstrated the feasibility of that. Um, the air rep messaging uh, is uh, is structured in a way to support those uh, uh, those applications uh, with ADSB PIREP uh, messages. We've um, we found a way to enable wake and counter reporting. Obviously, wake and counters, or well, maybe not obviously, but wake and counters would not be distributed as PIREPs, um, but the data would be uh, shunted off to um, to the folks that look at that for um, safety and, and efficiency purposes. Um, and then weather forecasting, uh, we've talked about uh, going back probably to you know, seven or eight years, we've talked about the, uh, the importance of air reps for weather forecasting and the ability of, of uh, more data to uh, result in better forecasts and, and, uh, and demonstrate better skill out of the models. Uh, one important feature, uh, one important thing that would come from uh, the significant increase we expect with air reps would be that the forecast feature sizes um, could be reduced uh, so that instead of icing forecasts that covered half the eastern seaboard, uh, you might have it uh, covering specific uh, areas, uh, similarly with turbulence. So the next chart. These are the uh, parameters in the air rep messages. There are three air rep messages, a weather state message, which gets broadcast uh, or will be broadcast every 2.2 seconds on average. Um, a little bit of dithering there, so um, to, uh, to preserve the, uh, the bandwidth environment. What would come out in that message um, is icing status information, uh, wind speed and direction, and a quality indicator uh, based on aircraft acceleration. And um, absent that, uh, the uh, the ground speed um, source for computation of the wind on board the aircraft. Air temperature uh, would come out as well. Um, pressure altitude um, or static air pressure is available from uh, existing messages and, and that, uh, that's something that would come out every uh, half second actually uh, in, the, in the current uh, message structures. Um, and then air speed uh, comes out in that message as well. Uh, there's a, a less frequent uh, message uh, that had some open bits in it that we were able to put some weather data in. Uh, the emergency priority status message uh, is an existing message into which uh, we've placed uh, mean eddy dissipation rate, peak eddy dissipation rate, and uh, the offset for that. So mean and peak represent those values of uh, eddy dissipation rate over the last uh, rolling one minute and the peak EDR offset places that peak value within that uh, last minute. Uh, water vapor also uh, would come out uh, in that message. Um, both EDR and water vapor are uh, quantities that, um, that are available today on some aircraft um, and uh, going forward uh, would, would uh, would also be available uh, assuming that operators 
invested in the systems that provide that information. Um, in terms of the uh, weather state message, um, those uh, those parameters in the 2.2 second message uh, are things that are on most uh, most commercial aircraft today, and in fact, many uh, smaller aircraft. Um, those things are available. Um, the uh, the third message is an aircraft state message. It would be broadcast on a five second interval as well, and it's. Uh, going to carry aircraft configuration information, which will tell uh, uh, receivers what the uh, landing gear and flat positions are. It'll include aircraft type uh, data as the uh, as the ICAO uh, type designator. Uh, it would carry gross weight either as the current gross weight. Uh, if aircraft are have the systems on board to uh, to be able to look at uh, what the current gross weight is. Otherwise, it would uh, send out its maximum gross weight or maximum takeoff weight for the aircraft. And then the uh, static value of aircraft wingspan also would go out on that aircraft state message. If you look at the next chart, we get to talk about pirate parameters. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of information here. Uh, also three messages, a flight weather message, a temperature wind and turbulence message, and a hazardous weather message. Uh, all of these or any of these would be broadcast um, only upon a pilot uh, making data entry into a uh, into a device that communicated with the transponder to place this information into the messages and then the transponder would would uh, take that information and send it out uh, enough times that we expect uh, greater than 95 percent probability of reception by the ground receiver network um, when the aircraft is within the service volume of the ADSB system. So um, all of these parameters are structured in a way to ensure that we can report uh, all of the encodable weather conditions that are currently encodable. Um, so uh, the full range of conditions that are uh, that can be placed in the PIREPS uh, can be uh, placed into these messages and sent to the ground uh, where uh, the messages would be decoded and, um, and an encoded PIREP as we know it today would be created. The only thing that we can't do is provide for free text. So there's no free form uh, uh, text kind of uh, submission with the ADSB PIREP. And there are a few limitations associated with uh, the resolution of things like cloud height, but we can we can report up to three different uh, flight weather conditions, three different layers associated with those types of conditions. Uh, we get uh, air temperature, uh, wind speed and direction, uh, turbulence, uh, uh, duration and intensity, location and type. Uh, we're able to report things that, um, that are normally only reportable in the remarks, such as uh, encountering uh, mountain waves, having low level wind shear, um, uh, the airspeed change associated with that, breaking action on runways, um, the runways associated with a low level wind shear report or a breaking action report. Uh, we can report things that have vicinity features, things that are only observable uh, at a distance like Virga. Um, and uh, and things you want to stay away from um, that uh, I think the administrator mentioned something about uh, thunderstorms uh, being um, something you can admire from afar. Um, you can report those from afar uh, using the ADSB uh, PIREP parameters. If you go to the next chart, you'll see how those messages would be um, captured by the ground uh, based data processing and placed into the elements of the standard encoded PIREP. So um, one of the things we had to do to um, to ensure that we got um, that good information uh, off the aircraft and to the ground with a limited uh, message number of bits we had was we encode a differential time associated with the report. And that time is used on the ground to track back along the, the ground track of the aircraft and place the um, 
uh, place the lat long at that time uh, from the ADSB track. Uh, we use that same uh, differential time to find the altitude at which the, uh, the reported weather applies. And then uh, we use the various messages that carry things like temperature and, and wind and turbulence and icing and the, uh, the things that we would put into the remarks like wind shear and breaking action and mountain wave and volcanic odor, et cetera, uh, into the uh, in the remarks section based on the, uh, the, the messages that would come down. If you go to the next chart, uh, our next steps include completing the final review and comment period, which is open until the 7th of May. Uh, uh, if we stay on schedule, we expect publication um, approval from the uh, RTCA and EuroK in September of this year. Uh, the document will probably hit the street by December in that case. And uh, within a year, we would expect a TSO. And within perhaps another year, we would expect to start to see avionics. So by uh, the end of 2022, we could have signal in space with, uh, with these capabilities uh, available. If you go to the next chart, <clears throat> um, I essentially uh, brief that first major bullet. The, um, uh, what that does is it means that the ground receipt and distribution planning for uh, ADSB weather uh, needs to really get underway. We've we've spent quite a bit of time uh, with the weather community saying, well, when I know I'm going to get the data, I'll start uh, I'll start planning to receive it. I think at this point we uh, we have fairly high uh, confidence that that data is going to be available, and we've seen uh, the weather community begin to respond, and that's that's really encouraging. Um, uh, however, the MOPS does not apply to ground-based systems and the, and the message handling and data dissemination for AIRUP data and the message handling and, and PIREP encoding for PIREP uh, message handling has to, uh, has to be planned and implemented. Go to the next chart. Uh, there is still a kind of a major outstanding uh, question that uh, we're trying to answer, and that is whether or not ADSB uh, version 3 compliant avionics are going to have to have ADSB weather as a native function, uh, meaning it's in the box, or uh, whether or not it'll be specified as an optional feature, which means that maybe it's in the box. And for those manufacturers who want to implement the capability, um, then it's up to them to put it in the box. You go to the next chart, <clears throat> we can see that um, there are reasons on, on either side of this argument. Um, the, uh, the reasons for, we've talked a, a lot about those. The reasons uh, uh, against being a native function or the reasons for being an optional feature. Uh, manufacturers are, are concerned about the cost to implement uh, a function that may not be used uh, by certain operators. And, and, uh, and those operator representatives are, are also concerned about having to buy a function they don't wish to implement uh, and paying that cost. Uh, the regulators are concerned that uh, if manufacturers choose not to implement uh, ADSB weather as a native function, that uh, that they would apply for exceptions, and, and there's costs associated with uh, processing those exception requests. Uh, and all of that is underpinned by the fact that ADSB version three is not expected to be mandated for rule compliance. Uh, so we've had. Uh, uh, feedback from uh, various folks that we've coordinated with that suggests that they'd like to see ADSB weather mandated for entry into rural airspace. Uh, they'd like to see it native to the uh, next generation of, of ADSB transponders, and that they'd like to see it optional. Um, and uh, right now, the uh, the regulator representatives to the to the Combined Surveillance Committee have uh, an action to. Uh, make a recommendation to the committee by the time we close FRAC um, as to uh, the direction to proceed. Let's go to the next chart. And these are the kinds of questions that the regulators are trying to answer. Uh, that first one would complete their action to the Combined Surveillance Committee. Regardless of how it's, um, how it's specified in the MOPS, though, they're going to have to uh, write requirements into the technical standards orders um, to which the boxes would ultimately be certified. And, um, 
and that question would uh, would raise up again in that uh, in that process. Um, and if it is required for uh, TSO compliance, then there's installation guidance that would have to be developed and given to operators regarding whether or not they would be expected to connect the inputs that support ADSB weather, or if they would be uh, allowed to not send the data, even if it's available on the aircraft. Uh, in terms of mandating entry into rural airspace, uh, uh, the same question, you know, 2A is reported, is repeated as 3A, and then uh, there's sort of a further question that says, are they going to go further and uh, and say, if you have to have it in rural airspace, do you have to buy systems for EDR and water vapor? Uh, we don't anticipate uh, any serious consideration of uh, 3B in terms of a, a mandate, or really even for 3A. Um, the uh, the community seems to be uh, focusing on getting uh, to 2A, and I think the next chart shows sort of where we want to be from a um, uh, the, the development standpoint from the uh, Combined Surveillance Committee's weather surveillance subgroup. So <clears throat> uh, in the upper left, you see that you know we're developing these these consensus standards that results in a MOPS. MOPS is typically referred to by the uh, technical standards orders through a regulatory process for avionics. Then there's a, an aircraft regulatory uh, process that lets you install the avionics in your aircraft. Um, and then there are operating regulations which tell you how you have to operate those things. Uh, what's depicted here is uh, what's specified in the green box. Uh, in the lower left where we'd like to see it specified as native in the MOPS and is required by TSO with operators free to choose uh, whether to hook up uh, the uh, the weather inputs. So you would end up with a TSO that allowed you to uh, that, that requires you to build a box with the with the weather data inputs um, that STC for the aircraft would uh, install that box into the uh, aircraft and operators would decide whether or not to hook up the uh, the onboard sensors to that box. Um, and that would enable ADSB weather on the basis of standards, avionics regulations and the interests of the operators. So as I as I mentioned, um, the, uh, the regulator representatives to the committee are tasked to make a recommendation on native function or optional feature. Um, during this final review and comment period, and that uh, closes on 7 May. If you go to the next chart, uh, our next steps are to continue uh, development of uh, both AIRREP and PIREP, uh, supporting the MOPS FRAC and uh, performing uh, comment resolution. For those of you interested in, in submitting comments through the FRAC process, uh, you can contact the RTCA for uh, a copy of the document. It's a, a mere 1,803 pages long. Um, however, the weather, the number of pages that ADSB weather touches is um, a little less than 250. So it is a uh, um, a uh, an accomplishable task to review those. And unless you're somebody who likes uh, uh, beating your head against the wall by reading test procedures, uh, the number goes down uh, considerably uh, from there. So the requirements for uh, air rep are on the order of 15 or 20 pages as are the requirements for uh, PIREP. And, um, and you know, once the requirements are reviewed, you learn where all of the uh, fields are, how they're specified, uh, what the range and resolution is, all those sorts of things. So. Uh, we're going to continue to plan uh, and prepare to receive the ADSB version three message or the ADSB uh, weather messages. Uh, we're going to continue coordinating with uh, the various stakeholder communities you see you see listed here, and we're going to start planning to harmonize the UAT ADSB standard with the 1090 ADSB standard. I think the next chart shows uh, the various entities that we've uh, we've coordinated directly with. Um, on the ASP and operator side, um, not just US, but internationally, um, up through ICAO, uh, through the Air Navigation uh, Commission panels, both the surveillance panel and the, and the MET panel. Um, 
and um, and the major uh, representatives uh, of the uh, of the commercial and the GA communities on the weather side um, from the uh, WMO on down through national weather offices and, and research organizations to the uh, manufacturers, the NTSB and and um, and other affected standards committees. Uh, one of the things that uh, has happened pre-publication of, of the MOPS is that the, uh, the folks that uh, worry about the installation kits for the aircraft are already beginning to implement uh, uh, revisions to their standards to support the ADSB version three uh, changes. Go to the next chart. <clears throat> Uh, there's my information uh, for any questions. I'm happy to answer questions now. The next, uh, uh, lost the count because Matt copied and pasted the page number here, but the next uh, about 25 charts or so um, go into depth on the uh, different parameters. So Matt, if you just want to scroll forward a couple of charts, you'll see an example of uh, what that looks like. So. Each of the air rep parameters uh, is represented. Uh, and then we get into the um, high rep parameters after that. And you can see how um, pilot encoding is, or pilot entry is done, encoding is done, and how it would be decoded and distributed on the ground. There's a lot of detail here that's available uh, for folks, and that'll be in the record uh, of the FPAW meeting. Yeah, that, that, that was why I had to go change my pants after I saw the size of the deck that you put in there. <laughs> but lo, look, you did it in 31 minutes. However, I don't know that we have time for questions, and there are questions uh, in the queue. Dave? Well, I think uh, we have a couple here. I think some of them got answered. Um, would a, uh, from uh, Matthias, would a uh, UAS operator be able to equip and participate contributing weather information via ADSB weather? Uh, <clears throat> the, my understanding is that for small UAS, they're not going to be allowed to uh, equip with ADSB as we know it today. Uh, however, the standard is, um, uh, is adaptable to other data links. The requirements that were developed um, were, uh, were particular to uh, 1090 megahertz ADSB. Um, they'll be changed slightly to be applicable to UAT on the 978 megahertz link. Um, but certainly, uh, all of the work that was done to establish what parameters, what ranges, what resolutions, uh, how frequently they were reported. Uh, all those sorts, all that work is uh, is preservable and applicable to implementing this kind of a capability on another data link. Okay, and uh, another question, would the raw data be available uh, live, similar to uh, Midcar's data used today uh, by uh, meteorologist dispatchers? Uh, will this be going to Mattis as well? Uh, yeah, the uh, the concept for the air rep data is that uh, MATIS as a national repository for uh, aircraft based observations would continue to be used for for these uh, these data. So uh, we don't have, as I said, for the last um, number of years, uh, we've had difficulty you know, getting a lot of traction with the weather community because they didn't want to put a lot of effort into planning for something that was uh, uncertain and I don't I'm not blaming I'm just uh, stating a fact uh, now that we've got uh, much greater certainty that this is going to be available uh, the weather community is stepping forward and, and uh, beginning to react to that and I expect that uh, planning uh, you know within the NOAA and National Weather Service for um, our archiving of this data would be a is something we'll be doing, you know, as part of the next steps. And uh, Matt, I think we have one more uh, in addition to whatever you had there. Uh, <laughs> Scott Scott Sampson, will airplane weather sensors have certification standards and calibration requirements similar to the current ground-based ASOS 
AWOS systems and how will data quality control be handled? So on the pilot rep side, the uh, the submitter is certified. Uh, the pilots are certificated and and, um, and we essentially trust them to observe appropriately and report appropriately. On the air rep side, uh, the guidance, uh, the appendix in, in the MOPS that talks about uh, input requirements for the air rep parameters uh, focuses on ensuring that the, uh, the best data available on board the aircraft is what's used uh, in the, uh, to, to put the data into the message. Uh, in most cases, that would be data that's uh, available to the flight crew in flight, which uh, on which they base um, in-flight decision-making. And uh, that's the basis on which that, um, that data would be, um, would be placed into the message. Uh, that said, the MATIS um, repository has a lot of uh, quality control checks it does, um, and, uh, and, and sensors do get out of tolerance, uh, even though they continue to, to provide their information to the aircraft uh, operators. Um, uh, MATIS is able at times to see when a sensor's uh, gone out of tolerance and, and notify the operator that that sensor is in, in question. Uh, and we would expect that to continue um, under the ADSB weather uh, air rep reporting. How are we doing, Matt? I think um... I think we 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 need to give Matthias and and yours truly at least ten minutes to get wrapped up here. So maybe we ought to call it right here. Okay. Uh, the I think the only other questions were yours uh, and Bob's anyway. So um, I think <laughs> Bob got his answered. And I'm not sure. You said you answered your own question or something at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And plus, this is all captured. So. If there's anything of importance there, well, we can pick it up on the backside. Okay, I do see that Tom George is asking if the uh, Arion ADSP system would be able to receive the version three messages. And Arion is is um, planning to make the uh, the necessary software changes uh, to ensure that they can decode the ADSP version three. In fact, uh, they're involved in the uh, in the combined surveillance committee to a, a large.